I need to make a, a confession. I'm under a doctor's care. It seems I have a touch of narcolepsy, so I could fall asleep. But the good news is that my doctor prescribed something in the States he called speech Viagra. And he said that speech Viagra will keep me standing tall and being fully alert during our time together. But he wanted me to warn you that there could be a side effect. Once I start talking, I could go on for four hours. So if I do, please call my doctor. Now, uh, when Bunty manipulated me into coming back, he's such a craftsman that he actually got me to volunteer to speak tonight. I thought it was beautiful. And I agreed readily because I thought it was an opportunity for me to tap into the pure boy fortune. But then I remembered that it's a Sunday, so it would require a weekend. And then I remembered something even more important, which is there's no honorarium. <laughs> so I want to assure you that Bunty Pierboy is going to get full value for every single dollar he spent. I've been doing a lot of speaking lately, and I like to say no, and I like to be selective. So I thought the way to do that was to set a very high price. So I went to this organization called the International Platform Association. They represent all these huge speakers, Bill Clinton. They represent virtually everybody that earns 100,000 speaking fees or higher. And I auditioned for them, and they said no. Uh, but the good news is they gave me the, the results of their segmentation research on audiences seems they have a great stake in audiences, and they've segmented them. Presumably all audiences have the same three segments, even this one. The three segments that they say exist in all audiences, the first one they call the rabid listeners. Those are the people that are writing down and remembering every single thing that you say. That's about 20%. Then there's a 20% they call the what's next group. And they're thinking about what's next. When's dinner? What time are we going to get home? What does my agenda look like tomorrow? Uh, all those things. So that's 40%. But according to them, and I didn't make this up, 60% they call the sexual fantasists. <laughs> now having nothing to do with the speaker, these are people that are experiencing intense sexual fantasies while you're speaking. So I'd like to thank you in advance for the opportunity to give so many of you so much pleasure. Now I could talk about advertising tonight. Um, I love advertising. But I'm going to talk about something that's really my favorite, most interesting, ongoing, and continuing topic. I'm going to talk about leadership. I'm going to talk about lessons in leadership, some of the things I've learned about leadership. And I'm going to talk about it because I think we have too little of it. I think we don't teach it very well. And in times of change, rapid change, which is always, we need more and more leadership. So I consider myself to be beyond fortunate. Beyond fortunate because I've had the great opportunity to practice leadership, to watch leadership, to study leadership, and to live leadership for a really long time. And the best things I've learned about leadership are the times that I've made mistakes in leadership. So all those things are true. I'm fortunate because this year, I celebrate 50 consecutive years in the advertising agency business. I've never been out of it. And in that time, I've had thousands of clients. At Interpublic, we had 4,500 clients. I got close to a lot of the CEOs. Uh, 
And in that time, in those 50 years, I've had the privilege of being either a CEO or a chairman for 45 years. So I've watched lots of people, learned lots of things from heads of state, all those things. And what I've focused on are what are the characteristics of leaders who lead change? Because that's what leadership is. Leadership is about leading change. I was dragged kicking and screaming into the internet in the early 90s. But once I got there, I loved it. Had great experiences. Our agency did the first website for the White House. We did the front end for the Netscape browser in the early 90s, way early. I had the great privilege of helping to find DoubleClick in a garage in Atlanta, Georgia, and incubating it to public. I also had the opportunity to take the first internet agency public, 1998, with a valuation of two billion. Of course, it didn't last through the 2000, but those were exciting times. I had the chance to be a senior advisor to Google for four years. And when my favorite mentee moved to become the CEO of AOL, I had the fun of being part of that turnaround, truly exciting. I had the privilege of being part of two turnarounds of Chrysler, one under the legendary Lee Iacocca, which was a total autocracy, and one under Bob Lutz, which was very different because it was systemic change. And I had the chance after 9-11, be one of 11 selected by the President for the Homeland Security Advisory Council and talk about change. We had 250,000 government employees in 11 agencies from Coast Guard to Border Control that we had to merge. Exciting times for sure. Today I get to chair the Advertising Age Global B2B Agency of the Year that we started six years ago very different experience, but extraordinarily fun. I'm an advisor still to AOL and Verizon, but the most important thing is I hang out with many startup and growth stage company in the internet, especially in the internet of things, which has the most exciting future, mobile and messaging. So I'm indeed a lucky man and it's with that perspective that we talk about leadership. I learned at school that leaders have four characteristics. This is school learning, not practical learning, but it's true. First characteristic is leaders have vision. And vision is not some pie in the sky crazy thing, but what it is, is it's the next best place, the next good place. What vision also is, is being able to see around corners just enough to take advantage. But most important, what vision is about is defining a worthy purpose. In today's world, young people and even old people want to align their values with the values of a brand and the values of a company. And a worthy purpose is not making next quarter's earnings. A worthy purpose is not kicking the hell out of the competition or becoming uh, the largest. A worthy purpose is something aspirational and big. And when companies have those worthy purposes, recruiting talent, aligning talent, and making change happen is extraordinary. I'm involved in an exciting shared workspace project. I call it the Bentley of shared workspaces because it's pretty cool. The higher purpose for that little project is to be a place of extraordinary comfort where the most talented people can challenge the uncomfortable. We could have said in the old days, we want to be the coolest spot, but people respond to worthy purpose, so that's vision. And that's a key job of a leader to define it. Second characteristic of a leader is integrity. And of course, everybody says leaders are, have integrity. Specifically, what that means to me is, do I trust that they're honest? 
Do I trust that they're consistent? And as importantly, do I trust that they will do what they say? Number two is integrity. Number three is courage. And courage is a tough one because to have the courage to make the tough decisions requires leaders to be vulnerable, requires leaders to overcome fear of their self-image being diminished, the fear of having someone say, if they had to make that decision, they must have done something wrong before. But that courage is extraordinarily important because it separates. And the timing of that courage is important. What I see lots of times, including now, is that a leader will understand what has to happen, but they wait. And they wait way too long. And when they wait, everybody in the organization wonders why they're waiting. So moving quickly through that fear is huge for leaders. The last characteristic of leaders is reality. I call reality the ability to call shit shit. Actually, the ability to look for weakness in themselves and their organization and to move through it. And that's hard because fear keeps many from doing that as well. So assuming that the leader has done the job with worthy purpose, assuming that's there, I've learned from watching and practicing that there are three things that leaders must focus on. I call it TLC. And of course, you could say it's tender loving care for the organization or tender loving care for the people, and that's important. But specifically, I'm talking about team leadership, their personal leadership, and culture. So let me spend some time on each one. Let's start with T for team. Team is a word that is overused and underpracticed. Successful big teams only come from small teams that are connected and connected to each other and connected to a worthy purpose. The dirty little secret is that big companies rarely create or innovate. But big companies can create and can innovate if they fully empower diverse cross-functional teams that cross silos and disciplines. The second Chrysler turnaround was all about that. They figured out that their biggest problem and the reason it took them so long to get to market and it was so much cost was that they were going up and down every single functional silo in the company every single time. They had a manufacturing design, marketing, sales, and engineering were all czars and they all had to opine on everything. So they blew it up. The first thing they did was two levels down, co-locate fully empowered teams that owned car platforms. Beautiful. Then they made all the czars interdependent. The head of design owned a minivan. The head of marketing owned a truck. They needed each other to succeed. Fully empowered cross-functional teams inside big companies can succeed. Teams win because the sum of the parts trumps individual effort. Seems obvious. Everybody talks about it. It doesn't happen. I'm a basketball fan, but the same holds true in other sports. If you look back at the NBA Finals in 2014, it was an epic battle between the Miami Heat and the San Antonio Spurs. Miami Heat had three huge stars, LeBron James, Chris Bosh, Dwayne Wade. San Antonio had 10 aging players, some people that had been stars, but all 10 played the same number of minutes. It was a cohesive, connected team, and they crushed the superstars. Cut to 2015, LeBron James' new team, probably the best player in the NBA.
but a new young kid, Stefan Curry, the Golden State Warriors. A lot of hype. Head to head. LeBron James versus Stephon Curry. No, not head to head. The telling thing was right before the final game, tied at three each. They interviewed LeBron James and they said, are you nervous about the final game? He said, no, I'm the best player in the planet. They interviewed Stephon Curry, are you nervous? He said, no. I like the way we're playing. Huge difference. And guess who the MVP of the whole series was? Neither one. A guy named Andre Iguodala, who was a second tier player. It's all about team. Teams find their real power when they give up ego, turf, hierarchy, and control. When they surrender those things, to a process that is to seize an opportunity or fix a problem. Teams gain their real power when they're willing to take their validation, not individually, but in bulk. So let's talk about personal leadership, the big L. Leading in transition, leading in change, leading in crisis, leading in turnaround, leading in startups, all those things and all the rest are all about things that test leaders. Leaders need to focus specifically on how they're leading through change. So the first job of a leader is to make people comfortable with change, to make their teams comfortable with the uncomfortable. They have to make them comfortable with the uncomfortable because in life there are two choices. The first choice is to identify, shape, and ride change to success. Or the second choice is to deny, resist, and ultimately get ruled over by change. So kissing change on the lips, maybe even giving it a little tongue, is probably a good thing. I have two favorite quotes. There was a quote after 9-11 by one of the generals, and what he said was, if you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance even less. Or the great Ben Franklin's quote was, when you're done changing, you're done. So making them comfortable with change is key. Leaders in change need to identify the four or five most important levers. The difference between leaders and managers is managers are great at <coughs> excuse me, cleaning their plates. Leaders are great at deciding what goes on the plate. And it can't be a laundry list, and it can't be 10 things. It has to be those four things that have the greatest leverage, maybe five. Leaders also know that the activity trap kills. The activity trap I define as, and believe me, I see it all the time, people working as hard as they can on all positive things that don't ladder up, that may not be those things that are gonna make the big difference. So there's the why and the what and the how. Leaders own the why. They share the what with their teams, but they give away the how. Said another way, leaders lead with kite strings because they know that if they can help all of their people get their kites flying high, they'll fly with them. Bad leaders manage with dog leashes. And that metaphor holds true. My mother is 98. She's quite amazing. And this year at the football Super Bowl, she and 12 other ladies decided to go to church. And they were going to have a conversation about what's the best advice they'd ever gotten. They're not going to sit there and eat popcorn and stuff and watch football with their spouses. They're going to do something productive. So I asked her what was the best advice she had ever given, and it pertains perfectly to this. 
she called it freedom and a framework. And when that framework is clear, leaders can give their people the freedom, but they need to define the framework. And I thought about what she taught me, and I thought that that's exactly how she raised us. There was a framework, but within it, we were free to move. Now, leaders move quickly because they know in change there's the quick and the dead. They also know that the tortoise only beats the hare in fairy tales. And they know that the first mover finds out the first answer. And the second mover has to figure it out later. Leaders in change must identify game-changing people and they must put them and give them the right jobs. I'm the chairman of the Compensation Committee of Time Inc., which is really exciting turnaround. Our comp committee every month asks management to tell us the gaps, where don't we have the right people, and who are the game changers. We're focused on what is the talent, and it's made all the difference. Because when the game changers come in and they're empowered, things happen, and they happen quickly. Now, leaders operate, and I, the most I've learned about marketing is, leaders in change operate from two things. They operate from a momentum calendar and a proof point roadmap. Momentum can become permission to believe that success can happen. Momentum can even be seen inside and outside as a surrogate for success. So momentum calendars are literally planning out the things that are going to happen and the achievements that are going to create the perception and the reality of momentum. Proof point roadmaps are different and they interact. Proof point roadmaps identify the barriers that inside and outside people are going to have in believing that you're going to get to a point. And when you lay out a proof point roadmap, you're laying out how am I going to knock down every single barrier to provide the permission to believe. When we started at AOL, Michael Eisner, the great CEO of Disney, met with us and said, you need to decide where you're going and then begin to start showing proof that you're going to get there. That's both momentum and proof point calendars. So leaders in change communicate and they over communicate. And they communicate about progress against the momentum calendar and the proof point roadmap. I watched great communicators and companies, and I watched the difference that communications make. So I did a little test. I took some money and set up a mini mutual fund. And I invested only in companies where I knew the CEO believed in communication, had it at the top of the radar screen, was going to communicate to investors, to stakeholders, to customers, and inside all the time. And the good news is, without any other criteria, not earnings, not growth, not anything, just communication, I beat the indexes by 25% three years in a row. Communication on leaders is huge. So now let's talk about the C, culture. And culture is the biggest and the most important because culture eats strategy for breakfast. And as I like to say, an A culture, even with B level players, will beat the hell out of a B culture with A level players. And if you have A plus A, get out of the way. Now cultures exist even when they're not stated. My definition of when a culture is good is this. It's the combined attitude, spirit, and talent working as one with an important purpose and a framework that's shared and believed. 
or you can take the definition of Zappos, the great internet company that's probably studied more than any other on culture. They've studied so much they've had to appoint a cultural ambassador that goes around and talks about their culture. They define good culture as attitudes, feelings, and values that drive behavior and inform the group and its members. So let's say those are good cultures. Bad cultures are far more prevalent. My definition of a bad culture is this. People are unaligned and they work and politic independently for their own personal gain, often at odds with the company's interest. Believe me, I've lived in bad cultures. I don't want any part of them. So, now, creating and maintaining good cultures starts with understanding the five things that are important and most important to the people that make up cultures. The five things that are more important than money. Now, money is important for sure, but assuming the money is fair, the five things that are most important that are at the bedrock of culture are these. The first is a belief in the future. Do I believe that this company, this city, this state, whatever, is going somewhere? And do I believe that there is a real possibility that they can get there? The second is, it's fun at work. It's safe and it's exciting. And I love the people. In fact, it's so much fun. Sometimes I'd rather be at work than be at home. The third is, they, and that's the big they, care about me, the person. Not me, the professional, not me, the functionary. They care about me, the person. I had a New Yorker cartoon framed in my office for a long time to remind me of the opposite. There was a cartoon of a portly, obviously tycoon type guy walking around a sea of cubicles. And he stopped in one cubicle and the balloon over his head said, keep up the good work, whatever it is whoever you are. They want to know that you care about them as the person, about their family, about how they feel, about their health, about anything other than their job. The third is they want to know that you appreciate what they do. If what they're doing is good, they want to know. If what they're doing is not good enough, they want to know. Especially now, the millennials are all about feedback. My two kids are fighting over who has more likes with their latest posting. They get instant feedback. And if we're not giving feedback, both an appreciation and that, we're missing it. The fifth thing that they want to know that's more important than money is, am I making a difference? Is what I'm doing contributing to winning? is what I'm doing contributing to the worthy purpose. I had a great opportunity. Um, AOL asks me to, uh, when it's requested, meet with lots of their customers on lots of subjects. So last month I had a chance to meet with the leaders of Dentsu and they wanted to talk about culture in the US. And they wanted to talk about how to get there and what to do with it. We came to a very exciting place. We talked about how most cultures are written at the top of the house and they have these huge pillars. Customer is king, trust, integrity, openness, all these great words. By the time they get to the people that do it, they're like, right, got it. What do you think? I don't do that. The better companies list behaviors that they're going to want. Ooh, now we're getting close to bedrock. Where we got was even more powerful. We wrote the cultural pillars in terms of feelings. I want to feel empowered to act without fear of failure. I want to feel connected to everybody else in the company, not isolated. When we got to that point, 
we had some real emotional things. And they're loving taking that different cultural statement out and recruiting people to a different kind of place. Leaders who are creating cultures encourage risk and they celebrate the learning that comes from failure. And they treat them the same. They treat success and the learning the same. And in change cultures, people are encouraged to fail early so they can succeed sooner. Change leaders are clear about who can take the risk and where is the space. We talk about Yahoo, which was a once great company, is now in the toilet. And people talk about, well, they picked the wrong CEO. They missed this, they missed that. It's all true. But it started 15 years ago when they were on the ascendancy because they forgot the most important thing. They forgot to tell the middle management what they could and couldn't do. So they had all these people pretending they had power, but they had none. So nobody knew how to make anything happen. I had a great first boss as an account executive in the business, a brilliant woman who did two things. The first thing she did was um, she said to me, I know that you don't know what you're doing. But she said, that's okay. She said, do you understand what we're trying to do? I said, yep. Yeah. She said, okay, go do it. And she gave me five Monopoly game get out of jail free cards. She said, I'd rather have you do it than ask permission. She said, if you screw up, I'll have your back. Just bring me one of these cards. I'd rather have you do things than wait because you don't know exactly what to do. And then she said something which was the second thing I've never forgotten. She said, on these six things, you own them. These two, I want you to check with me. This one, you have to check with me because I have to check with my boss. How clear is that? It was fabulous. Change leaders set up two kinds of things that get lost in the shuffle all the time. The first is they take meetings and how meetings are done really seriously. Anybody ever been to a bad meeting? Somebody says, we need to have a meeting. Why? We need to discuss this. Duh. Okay. Great leaders follow what I call the four C's. The first C is clarity, which is what is the expected outcome of this meeting? What are we really meeting to accomplish? My favorite question with clients used to be, what would have to happen if this were the best meeting you'd ever had? Half the time I'd find out that what I thought was going to be a great meeting was not what they thought. So at least we had a chance to adjust to find out what they thought was more important. So what is the purpose? What should be the outcome? That's clarity. The second is context. In great meetings, the consumer or the customer is always in the middle of the table what they think, what their data are, what those insights are, is at the table. Second thing is the competition's at the table. Always. You know how many meetings go and ignore the two most important things in business? The third is consensus. Consensus is not, here's what we're going to do and everybody goes like this. Consensus is arguing both sides and making certain that both sides are argued. Okay, we've heard the positive. Who wants to take the negative? When I got to Google, Dr. Eric Schmidt, the CEO, said that when he got there, he thought that Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the founders, were going to kill each other. He said, I thought, I've made a terrible mistake. And then he realized that they were doing it on purpose. That if somebody didn't take the opposite side of an argument, one of them would do it to get it out. So can, real consensus is that. But then leaders have a responsibility when real consensus happens. 
They can't chase the decision out of the room. If they do, the politicking starts, and it's unbelievable. People come to the office and say, you really can't let them do that. Right? I know, he's well-intentioned, but we have to do this. And all of a sudden, the politics and the poison enters the system. So it's only three perfect responses. The first is, we've heard both sides. We're going to take a decision. We're going down this route. Is everybody on board? The second is, we're not going to make a decision today because we need more data. Let's get these data. And the third is, this is too important to make a decision on the spot. I'm going to sleep on it, but at 8 o'clock in the morning, you'll have the decision. So real consensus and a clear path on when a decision will be made. The last is commitment. Who owns it and when is the deliverable? So those are key, key factors. Second things leaders do is they set up contract of expectations with their people. They have real conversations that they hang in on. Nothing is left to chance. It's not an assumption. They have conversations like, here are the things that really piss me off. So probably, probably don't want to do those things. Here are the things that I really expect. These are the things that are really important to me. Here's my style. I like to have early morning meetings. I hate to have late night meetings. Setting up that contract of expectations is huge. The real dialogues are also game changers. I finally figured out how to do employee evaluations after screwing it up for a lot of years and listening to HR departments. I used to say on Tuesday, we're going to have a meeting to discuss how we're working together. So you have an assignment. Your assignment is to tell me the things that I'm doing that you want me to do more of that are helping you the most. Second is you're going to tell me the things you wish I did better. And last, you're going to tell me the things I'm doing you want me to stop. You're going to go first. And I'm going to judge you on how candid you are. Then I'm going to do the same thing for you. And we're going to have a real dialogue. Those things make all the difference because there's nothing left to chance. Leaders in change find systemic ways of constantly bombarding their teams with what's new and what's best. My good friend Mike Hughes, now deceased, who was the legendary creative director of the Martin Agency, taught me what's best in the most powerful way. When I took over as CEO of Interpublic, I went to visit his agency and I walked in his office and on his wall were eight pieces of advertising, none of which the Martin Agency had done. And he changed them. And I said, what? I've not seen that before. I said, I do it to remind people that we want to beat the best, not to beat our best. Big difference. Bombarding people on what's new. My friend Alan Cohen, who was the CEO of Omnicom Media Group North America, set up one Friday a month in which they would invite seven startup companies that impacted how they did business to come in, give their presentation. They set apart an entire afternoon. Then they would go out to dinner and talk about the implement, implementation and whether they were going to move forward with it. What's new and what's best lifts and ideas, and it also lifts performance. Lastly, leaders never make it about them. My mentee, Tim Armstrong, did a thing at Google I'll never forget. He was quickly becoming a rock star because of the growth. And he called in our head of PR and he said, I don't ever want for the next year any stories about me. I want stories about Penry. I want stories about Eileen. I want this. I don't want any stories about me. It's too much. And it's not about me. It's about the team. When leaders give that up, that changes. Chuck People are my partner who spoke here, uh, my partner for 25 years. I uh, could have taken all the credit. 
he made huge room for me. And he shared the stage, and it made all the difference. So, leaders also know the rule of two. The great Dr. Cotter, the great professor of change and transition at Harvard, talks about why leaders need managers and managers need leaders. I take it one step further. It's never about one. It's always about two. And when people find their alter ego and put that person close to them and stay tight with them, magic happens. So in closing, uh, let me say that leaders are certainly born, but I believe that leaders are also made. Families need more leaders, companies need more leaders, city, state, and the world needs more leaders, particularly in times of change. I've seen unbelievable things happen when leadership is done right, and I hope I've given you some things to think about. Thanks for letting me come back and speak at the 35th Pure Boy Lecture. Hi, David. Uh, this is Vijay Reiki. I believe, uh, first of all, compliments to you. You have encapsulated uh, in whatever time you took uh, distilled experience and uh, I hope that could be used as a template for success, be it before state, city or a corporation. So. Let's assume it is a very good template, a realistic template. Why do you think people do not imbibe and practice some of the gems which you have put on the table just now? There are two barriers to practicing most of these things. The first is ego. And when people get placed in major positions, they become totally believing that they are supposed to know everything and they're supposed to be some kind of different thing than they are. So their real self and their projected self gets messed up. But the other thing is fear. And the fear is people are afraid of being vulnerable. They're afraid of taking our decisions. They're afraid of opening up a broader group of people to make change. Because if they're at the top of something, they think that's supposed to be what they do. So I would say ego and fear are the two biggest barriers. Yeah, David, uh, I first of all here, I am Vivek Man Singh. Um, question is on globalization aspect of organizations and global leadership with the changes that you talked about, with diversification you talked about, with culture you were talking about. Culture means different countries, different culture. Organization wants to develop its own culture. All of this complexity and the speed of change. You talked about Internet of Things which itself means development of all kinds will not take place within the boundaries of your organization. So what is the aspect of global leadership that new leaders have to watch out for? I think what global leaders need to watch out for is centralization. Um, centralization kills initiative, kills innovation. They have to create the right kinds of frameworks that can be translated globally. The other thing they have to watch out for is not listening to what's happening in different places. I love the concept of bubble up. Okay? Bubble up both on the input and bubble up on execution. When a culture has both of those things, it's totally different from a centralized kind of culture and you leave way too much on the table. You know, I've watched companies like Coca-Cola go back and forth. I've watched companies like Microsoft go back and forth. And there is a beautiful medium in between total centralization and total 
anarchy. And it comes around with freedom. It's fun to watch over the times a new CEO comes in centralizing all marketing. We were the beneficiary. Microsoft went from 2,000 agencies to two. And uh, the 5,000 people that lost freedom set out to kill the centralization on the day they announced it. Uh, and eventually, the dike opened up and the centralization move started happening. Same thing at Coca-Cola, same thing at big companies. So the biggest thing is to define that beautiful middle ground. Uh. One of the things that we did at Chrysler that worked like crazy in the 90s is we created a online digital platform that took every single photograph and video of every single vehicle Chrysler made in the world and made it accessible to creative directors and to art directors. And we didn't tell them how to create, but we did tell them, before you spend money redoing a photo that cost 25,000, maybe you wanna check one of these and see if it might work with your idea, rather than say, you will do everything this way. The mid-ground, or we should say here, the middle road. Uh Hi, Mr. Bell. Yes. Good evening. My name is Aditya Mendonca. And uh, what is your advice for mobility startups? What is my advice for startups? Mm -hmm. um, well, it depends on the startup. I think uh, the same kind of advice we're talking about. Obviously, in a startup, leadership has a tighter leash. But it's still totally about culture and team. It's 100% about culture and team. When I go into a startup, I can tell in a minute, just like I used to be able to tell in agencies, whether they're going to make it based on the energy, based on the team. The other advice to a startup is that the hardest single thing that's much harder than a startup is moving from a startup to a growth stage company. And most entrepreneurs fail, and they fail because they think that going to a growth stage company is exactly the same as going to a startup becoming successful that they have to keep doing the same things the same way and that's not true okay? so constantly learning and growing good evening my name is Anik Banerjee uh, see a good batsman in cricket plays uh, as per the pitch how the pitch is behaving so similarly uh, do you think that a leadership style should can vary as per the evolution of the evolution of the com company I mean, for example, if there's a crisis and there's a turnaround to be affected, so a leader can be more centralized, and in a more happier times, it can be more democratic. So do you think that uh, you know, that, is, that should be done, or how it is? I think crisis and turnaround are very similar. Uh, change happens faster in crisis. In turnaround, you need to operate as if you're in a crisis. I love turnarounds because change can happen. <coughs> I hate turnarounds because it always involves getting rid of the legacy people, killing the past clingers. And past clingers have stopped more turnarounds and crisis situations in the world. They're the deniers. And you can tell them when they walk into a room. When the IBM turned around, when Lou Gerstner turned IBM around, I'm on the board of Time Inc. with the head of HR during that time period. And he told me what happened. There were so many past clingers because IBM was so successful that what Lou Gerstner started doing is having meetings only with game changers, regardless of what rank. And so people started saying, why am I not in that meeting? And pretty soon it started to dawn on people that he was only meeting with people that were getting it and moving forward. And the other people were becoming irrelevant. And that speeded up the process of turnaround and change at IBM. Uh, this is Neha from the Exchange for Media Group. You spoke of TLC. Um, India got a new CEO uh, two years ago. And since you've worked with a lot of heads of state, 
Uh, I'd like to know what your observations are in terms of TLC uh, with regards to our Prime Minister who is leading a, a lot of new things in India, leading change in India. So, say again, you want me to define TLC? Uh, I want your observations on um, the governance pattern in India today under our, uh, our new leadership, our new leader, uh, Mr. Modi, Prime Minister Modi. Do you have some observations to make, sir? Yes. Um, I think that if you had to start on one, I would start with team. And with team, when you have a connected team, it spreads out to a culture. When people in a company see that the management team is totally aligned, connected, have each other's back and working, the culture change quickly. When you don't have that, everybody will work against the divisiveness of the people to try to pull it back and to pull change back. And they'll do just what we talked about. Go into the office that somebody that they sense is maybe not part of the team and lobby them and play with them. But when they see a team of people every time they meet, that's totally connected and energetic moving forward. Other people get on board quickly. So I'd focus on that. Who are the people? The biggest single thing I see is that you give people a chance to get on board with change. Every chance. If they don't, kill them. They're gone. Because they will only poison everybody else. Um, David, so uh, just wanted to get your insight on, I think you touched upon, you were in Chrysler, working with Chrysler, with Lee Iacocca as well as Bob Lutz. Something similar to Steve Jobs and Eric Schmidt, maybe. Uh, autocratic, brilliant uh, expert versus a democratic, you know, guy who's trying to bubble up. And sometimes companies need a little bit of the first and sometimes companies need a little bit of the last. Um, and all brilliant managers, right? All brilliant leaders. So is there a balance or you have to be one or you have to be the other? I think it depends on the situation. I think that um, in the first Chrysler crisis, there was not time to do transformative change. So there had to be direction. And everybody knew that everything stopped with Iacocca. Uh, I can remember in a boardroom that was almost as long as this room, the Iacocca is sitting at the end with a light box and me with a photo of a K-car and him approving the photo for Nat. Now this is a giant company, but that was because we had to move quickly. When you have the luxury of things not being in a disaster, then you can work toward transformative change. But I think Apple is going to be very interesting to see what happens now. Because the legacy is always, what did they leave behind? Bob Lutz was a giant ego, is a giant ego, super charismatic, unbelievable guy. Um, one of my great heroes, but he also transformed process. And when you change process, you have the biggest chance of having sustaining change. So at Apple, how much was Steve Jobs really making all those key decisions? And how strong is the organization in his wake? We'll see. We'll see by what products come out. One of the things for me with Apple that I find astonishing is, with all of Apple's success, they don't have CRM. If you think about that, they don't have CRM. Okay? I bought my first iPad. I left it on a train like an idiot. I had got it. It was early on. So I went back to Apple and I said, I need another iPad. They said, we're sorry, you're going to have to wait. And I said, mean, I'm going to have to come back to the store and stand in line? They said, yes. I said, okay, um, do you know how much money 
I've spent with Apple on my family in the last two years. They said, no, we don't have any way of knowing that. Right? Excuse me? When you don't have CRM and something goes bad, you are in big trouble. Fortunately, nothing's really gone bad, but just think how cool it would be if they could, with a CRM program, identify evangelists and come to Bunty Pureboy and say, Bunty, we want you to be the first to have the iPhone 7 because we know you proselytize. You'll tell everybody you know in Bangalore about it, right? Think about the power of that. Or think about the power of them sending me a note saying, you know, your iPad is getting a little long in the tooth. We have a really great special right now. If you bring it in, we'll upgrade it with 256 megabytes for the cost of $2. Really? You'll do that? Right? They do none of that. It's crazy. That's because Steve Jobs' vision, which is totally genius, is if the product is intuitive and perfect, we don't have to worry about that stuff. Why not? Why not have both? Thank you, David, for a very wonderful, lucid presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask you, from your 40 years of experience of working with leaders, in times of change, uh, do you see a gender aspect to the kind of leadership that men or women bring into leading change? Yes, uh, and uh, I think that uh, companies that have a good concentration of women in high positions with men do better because there are gender differences and uh, they bring different skill sets to the table. Um, I can tell you right now that women are much less maintenance than men. If you want a high maintenance organization populated all with men, right? I can tell you that mostly women are born better managers than men. Uh, so yeah, there are differences, but it's magic when you have both. It's also magic when women are in touch with their masculine side and men are in touch with their feminine side. So my advice is, if you're one, get in touch with the other side because when you bring both to the table, you're much stronger. There is a lot of talk nowadays that as important as leadership is in organizations, there's also an importance of followership. And this is a concept being discussed today because most organizations have a challenge if they have only leadership and no followership. Would you have anything to comment on this? Yes. I would start by saying that, and I should have mentioned it, but I wanted you to have the chance to ask a <laughs> beautiful question. Leaders know when to be followers, and great leaders are willing to be followers. Leaders know that there is no anointing, appointing, or promoting a leader. Leaders generate their leadership every time they walk into a room. But what really separates leaders is when somebody else can be a leader on something they follow. So followership, followership is as important as leadership.